you're watching the BSO Gun Channel, and it's currently noon. Noon. So since it's just fabulous outside, I'm gonna spend my day editing a video for you guys. This is the AB Suppressors F4. And we've done some work with AB Suppressors previously on their Raptor series, which is their rifle rated cans. And those are some exceptionally lightweight rifle rated cans. This is a dedicated nine millimeter can of the like PCC variety. And this continues that trend in being lightweight. This is also what I would classify as a K-Can. For anybody who is not familiar with that terminology, the way I put it is that a K-Can is a can that has made a compromise in its performance in lieu of dimension. So what they've done is they've made this thing super lightweight and tiny. They've shrunk it considerably to make it small. Well, through some feedback through the, uh, the end users, they have come out with this guy, and this is the F4L. As you can see, there is a slight dimensional change that is probably going to come along with some performance increase. And that's what we're gonna be looking at in today's video, specifically the F4L versus the F4. And I'll have some specifications on screen so that you guys can nerd all over the place if that's what you're into. And let's get to the testing. When we're talking about nine millimeter pistols, what we're usually talking about is some kind of booster device on the back of the can that makes it even longer, that allows it to operate on a tilt breech action semi-automatic pistol. And for the most part, it, it runs on a semi-automatic pistol. And this thing has no possibility of integrating a booster of any kind. Now we're just using standard 115 grain, so I don't expect the F4L is going to function, but we're here, we might as well try, right? Yeah, same kind of thing. And what it is that we're experiencing here is that the weight on the end is just too high. So basically the F4 
is light enough for the action to continue to operate unimpeded. The F4L is just a little bit too heavy for that to happen. Now moving on to accuracy. And when we talk about accuracy as far as cans are concerned, what we're really talking about is the state unsuppressed to the state suppressed. What's the difference really? Because it's gonna act different on different guns, but we can get an idea approximately things like does the group size get smaller? And is there any appreciable point of impact shift? You know what? I'm really unhappy with the position of that round on the target. So we're gonna go ahead and just move the scope really quick. That way, if there is any positional shift, then you guys will be able to actually see it. Right now it's kind of walking off the right side of the target. So, we're just gonna take it left a fair amount. Alrighty, so here at the end of the range, lay of the land real quick. First round that was about to walk off of the paper and then we did that zero correction to bring us back to the center so that we stayed all on. That turned out to be a good decision. <laughs> suppressed group, unsuppressed group. Now here's the thing. This is atypical performance. Usually when we add a suppressor, we see the group shrink or stay the same size. In this instance, they got a little bit more unstable. That these groups are in relatively the same position to point of aim. So I was aiming here, suppressed group, aiming here, unsuppressed group. So let's see roughly how far we are from, from the center here. So we're gonna call that roughly the center of that group. Off of point of aim, that's uh, 1.6. And uh, I'll do that again for you guys. Roughly the same. So I'm gonna say that while the performance as far as the stability is concerned is not lighting the world on fire, at least we don't have any egregious point of impact shift. So let's take a second and talk about recoil reduction. I changed my setup a bit for this one so we could swap over to nine millimeter and basically that amounts to me taking the apparatus apart and swapping my Z5P in. Same protocol as always, an average of three shots. And when we crunch the numbers, we get about a 27% reduction on the F4 which seems to be just about where we were measuring previously. However, when we compare that to the results from the F4L, we're coming in at almost double that. I thought about this and it's really not that surprising considering these are delayed blowback guns and they actually have relatively high recoil for their caliber. But at any rate, the L variant has substantial performance increase. Moving on to the gassing test. Now here's the thing about testing gassing with these types of cans. These are 9mm cans, meaning that in most instances, you're going to be shooting these guns on 9mm pistols and rifles and things like that. In most instances, those weapons are going to be either direct blowback or delayed blowback. And in those instances, well, gas doesn't really matter. However, I do hear tell that, and I'm not sure that I can let this go yet or not, but they're working on a version that can accept onto 300 blackout guns, as in the thread pitch is correct for 300 blackout. It's common for a lot of people to use their 9mm cans on 300 blackout subs. So what I have here is not a 300 blackout gun. This is a 5.56 gun. It's the one that we use for gassing, and it's got the rifle speed gas control on it. And this is nice because it's a very visual aid that allows us to determine what the gas changes are. These cans are not rated for 5.56. However, it is a practice that is often used is if you've got a sealed sub can, like a nine millimeter 45, something like that, and a can is sealed, you can't take it apart, can't use it, service it uh, by the end user. It is a common practice to shoot a full powered rifle round or two through it to clean it. So 
I think that that means that it's okay that we can do this, but if it explodes, then it explodes. What we're gonna be doing today is actually a relativistic test between the F4, which is the short version, the original, and the F4L. Basically, how much does the extra length and girth of the F4L impact the gassing? So here we go, a couple rounds, maybe. It looks like we have a perfect three o'clock ejection right here, uh, and that is on setting five. So let's go ahead and clear this weapon out. And it looks to me as though this did not destroy this can. And we can get it off sort of without burning ourselves. Now here's the thing. This gun is still set up from the last time we were out here when we were doing the testing with Ryan Macbeth. This is running fine unsuppressed all day. You could say that there's really no gas change on the F4. Now we've got the F4L on here. The brass is literally landing in the same pile. So I'm gonna say, yeah, this, this can's probably gonna be really nice on 300 Blackout uh, once they either jailbreak the end or give us a version that is 5 eighths by 24. It is a beautiful night out tonight. Got some stars. Whew. We're gonna lead off with unsuppressed at the muzzle and this is 115 grain ammunition uh, supersonic. At the ejection port, obviously overshadowed by the muzzle. F4 at the muzzle. At the ejection port, We have the F4L at the muzzle. At the ejection port. And let's go ahead and recap our testing on the F4L from AB suppressors. Critiques. First and foremost, we saw a little bit of accuracy degradation with this device, roughly 50% degradation, which translated to roughly a two inch group at 50 yards. Now, I'm not super upset about that in this particular instance. If this was a centerfire rifle can, we would be talking a completely different story, but this is a nine millimeter PCC can. I have a question for you. What is the effective range of a nine millimeter PCC? I'm gonna ballpark that at roughly 200 yards, so if we're getting a two inch group at 50 yards, then at, according to my public education math, we should be sitting roughly at an eight inch group at 200 yards. And that's really not that bad considering that I've tested 308 battle rifles that can't achieve that level of performance. So I'm gonna give them a provisional pass on the accuracy side of things, but what I would like to focus on is that I would like to see this device become some persuasion of user serviceable. Now we have a welded stack here, so there's only so much that we can do. The end cap of this thing is removable, but what I would really like to see happen is the rear half of this thing have some modularity included uh, for the purposes of changing the mounts and cleaning it. So right now, as I mentioned, you could take the end cap off and throw it in the ultrasonic cleaner, but I would like the ability to uh, get into the expansion chamber. On to the major takeaways, the flash performance on this device is fantastic. It is a drastic improvement over the F4, the original, the K-Can, and I would say also that the sound signature is a drastic improvement over the F4. So again, the F4 would be the K silencer that is just going to make a compromise in order to make it nice and short. 
add a little bit more girth to it, and you get a better sounding can. Now, you do sacrifice the pistol compatibility as in the handgun compatibility, which to be honest, I have dedicated pistol suppressors and I never use them. Now, the last thing I wanna point out is that the stress induced on the operating system doesn't seem to be all that high using this device. Oftentimes, firearms that spend a whole lot of time suppressed end up needing more maintenance time because well, they just get beat up more. It's not just that they get dirtier faster, it's that there's more stress induced on the operational components, leading to more breakdown. And it doesn't seem to be the case with this device. It doesn't seem to do a whole lot, so you can expect it to operate roughly as normal. And that's exceptionally important, especially if you're using something fragile, like say an MP5.